Bun găsit la emisiunea Știință și Cunoaștere. Revenim cu noutăți de ultima oră legate de reversul îmbătrânirii și vindecarea maladiei Alzheimer propuse de profesorul american Michael Fossell. În prezent, domnia sa este în așteptarea finalizării testelor de toxicitate ale produsului său, un complex molecular cu țintă programată care resetează telomerii celulelor gliale. Mi-a promis că îmi va oferi posibilitatea de a urmări etapele de cercetare și testele clinice, ceea ce mi se pare un lucru extraordinar. Puțin jurnaliști beneficiază de asemenea avantaje și mă bucur că sunt unul dintre ei. În interviul recent înregistrat am aflat și am înțeles detalii cu totul inedite despre funcționarea celulei, a telomerilor și a enzimelor. Din ceea ce mi-a spus, profesorul Fossel se pare că avansează cu viteză maximă și în doar câteva luni activatorul genetic va putea fi testat pe primii pacienți cu Alzheimer în Statele Unite. Pentru a vă ușura înțelegerea discuției care urmează, voi încerca în câteva fraze să fac o sinteză a celor mai importante detalii. Boala Alzheimer se produce din cauze diferite care fac imposibile stabilirea unei reguli clare. Au fost detectate anumite gene a căror activare se corelează cu incidența bolii, dar, cu toate acestea, există indivizi care au gena Alzheimer, dar nu toți manifestă boala. Respectiv, există indivizi care nu au gena pentru Alzheimer, dar unii dintre ei manifestă boala. În plus, s-a mai descoperit o genă care se corelată cu o protecție crescută la Alzheimer. Însă, cu toate acestea, există indivizi care, deși au gena protectoare, totuși unii dintre ei manifestă boala, iar alții care nu au gena protectoare nu manifestă boala. Din punct de vedere statistic, factorul de risc este mai mare la cei care nu au gena protectoare, respectiv la cei care au gena pentru Alzheimer. Însă, există suficient de multe excepții care fac imposibilă definirea unei reguli. Referitor la resetul telomeric și o posibilă incidență a cancerului, profesorul Fossel are o nouă teorie. Până nu demult se credea că, dacă se produce prea multă telomerază sau este activată prea multă telomerază, atunci crește riscul de cancer. Ei bine, majoritatea cazurilor este exact invers. Însă, cum spuneam mai devreme, nu există o regulă absolută. Ideea se bazează pe următoarea logică. Situația 1. Dacă telomerii sunt scurtați la maxim, atunci celulele nu se mai divid, indiferent dacă sunt celulele canceroase sau normale. Iar în acest caz, acele celule, dacă au apucat să creeze o tumoare, aceasta nu mai crește și poate fi îndepărtată. S-a observat faptul că există celule canceroase care nu sunt capabile să-și autoreseteze telomerii. În acest caz, ele nu reprezintă un pericol, deoarece proliferarea s-a oprit. Celulele au devenit disfuncționale, dar nu mai produc creșteri tumorale. În această situație, chemoterapia este foarte eficientă și pacientul va supraviețui. Această informație poate salva vieți. Un simplu test al telomerilor poate stabili dacă chemoterapia va avea efectul scontat. Situația 2. Dacă celula are telomeri foarte lungi, atunci ea se va divide și totodată își va repara ADN-ul, ceea ce înseamnă că odată ce s-a produs acest reset telomeric, indiferent dacă e vorba de o celulă canceroasă sau o celulă normală, ea se poate autorepara, redevenind funcțională. În această situație, un reset complet al telomerilor, până la limita maximă admisibilă, va favoriza repararea ADN-ului, nu se vor mai produce mutații, iar la următoarea chemoterapie, toate celulele disfuncționale vor fi eliminate și pacientul va supraviețui. Situația 3. Dacă o celulă are telomeri cu ceva mai mult decât limita minimă, ea înseamnă că mai are capacitatea de a se divide, însă în același timp ea nu își mai poate repara ADN-ul. Iar în acest caz, celula normală se divide cu erori, celula canceroasă suferă mutații și începe să se dividă necontrolat. Aceasta e situația cea mai nefavorabilă și din acest motiv, asemenea celulele devin rezistente și la chemoterapie. Invenția profesorului Fossel și noua sa abordare constă în trimiterea unui complex molecular format din o genă umană artificială și un promotor către celula țintă. Acesta intră în celulă, eliberează gena, stimulând crearea telomerazei, iar aceasta, la rândul ei, va produce resetul telomeric, dar, la următoarea diviziune a celulei, gena umană artificială și promotorul se pierd. Procesul se estompează, iar celula își va utiliza telomerii noi primiți, fără să se readauge alții la fiecare nouă diviziune. În felul acesta, cancerul este prevenit. Acesta este un proces natural de autolimitare. 
vechea abordare cu activatorul genei deja existente în nucleu nu are un efect atât de profund și la acea vreme se suspecta riscul de cancer. Așadar, nu vă grăbiți să cumpărați tot felul de activatoare al căror efect este îndoielnic. Mitocondriile celulare nu îmbătrânesc, dar ele pot suferi avarii sau disfuncții tot datorită scurtării telomerilor din nucleul celulei. O mică parte din mitocondrii totuși îmbătrânesc, dar o mare parte din celulele somatice îmbătrânesc datorită scurtării telomerilor. În opoziție cu aceasta, celulele reproducătoare nu îmbătrânesc deloc, chiar primesc mai mulți telomeri, iar celulele stem îmbătrânesc foarte puțin. O altă informație interesantă este legată de faptul că avem și celule normale care nu se divid sau se divid foarte puțin, precum celulele mușchiului cardiac, neuronii și altele. Teoretic, ele nu ar avea motiv să sufere avarii, însă, datorită faptului că sunt dependente de alte celule care se divid rapid și îmbătrânesc, distrugerile apar în mod indirect, astfel o celulă neuronală suferă avarii datorită celulelor gliale adiacente. O celulă din miocard suferă avarii datorită celulelor sistemului arterial care le hrănește. Prin urmare, boala Alzheimer nu este consecința îmbătrânirii celulelor neuronale, ci a îmbătrânirii celulelor gliale. Sper că acest rezumat a fost suficient de clar și concis pentru a vă ajuta să aprofundați ceea ce am discutat cu profesorul Fossel în interviul înregistrat pe Skype. Multe alte detalii le veți afla în minutele următoare. Dear Professor Michael Fossel, welcome to our special edition on telomeres and telomerase activator TV program Science and Knowledge on TVR Cluj, Romania. Thank you, Christian. It's a pleasure to be with you again. We are going to discuss additional issues about your research on Alzheimer, telomeres, telomerase enzyme, telomerase activator, and the complex plan regarding curing this disease and restore patients' cognitive functions. And I thank you very much for this amazing opportunity. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. In order to save important minutes, I will strongly advise our viewers to watch again our previous episode about Alzheimer and then watch this one as a part two of our program. First question, please tell us what would be your next three years plan for complete the research and the human trials. Well, we're going to be going through the FDA in the United States, as you know, though I've considered doing it in the United Kingdom. Um, the first thing we need to do is finish what's called a toxicology uh, animal study for the FDA. And after that, they give us permission to do the human study. We're hoping to start the human study at the end of 2019. Um, so that's our next plan. After that, of course, we'd be moving on to broader spectrum and doing trials globally. If we compare other human trials, which need many years to show any results, is there any chance in your research to obtain the results in a shorter time? Can you estimate with approximation? Yes, <clears throat> there are two reasons why this should go a lot faster than other human trials. The first is that we expect to get good results in a disease like Alzheimer's, and that means that most of the regulatory agencies, both in the United States and elsewhere in the world, for example, in the EU, uh, will permit us to move faster toward commercial availability, to make it available to people. Um, the other reason, though, is that the effect that we're anticipating seeing is a much more powerful effect than anything that's been seen in other Alzheimer's trials. Uh, they tend to deal with, with symptoms, uh, downstream effects rather than upstream causes of Alzheimer's, whereas what we're doing is resetting gene expression. So we expect to see, even in the initial 12 patients in our phase one trial, we anticipate seeing excellent clinical improvement in our patients, not just a slowing of disease. So again, for two reasons. You know, one, it, we expect the, that once we have an effect shown, a lot of the regulatory agencies will encourage us to move faster, which makes it easier to get to people. And two is, it's such a powerful effect that I think that we will have no problem um, demonstrating it earlier than anyone else can. So yes, we should be able to move a lot faster. I think that uh, we should easily be able to see commercial availability within five years if things go well. 
You said in many occasions and interviews that numerous tests had been performed on animal models like mice, already proved your solution and showed results, while no one else had obtained. But why I can't read anywhere about these amazing achievements? Did you publish those results? Well, the animal results have been published by a number of other authors, <clears throat> including one who'd been at Harvard, another who's now in Madrid at CNIO, that is Maria Blasco. Those aren't my results. Uh, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the implications, the potential for this has been clear for about two decades now since I first published it 20 years ago. Um, but the actual animal results have only been available in the last five years. And I think that a lot of people don't understand the implication of it. They don't see what we're driving at. Um, they tend to go after the same target again and again, even though they fail repeatedly. More than 400 registered trials all have failed. Uh, but when, you, when they look at new data, they don't understand it in terms of what they've been doing. They are still looking in the wrong place. So when the data comes out, they don't understand the implications of it. They don't understand the potential for, for a clinical outcome. Um, it makes it harder for people to, to focus on what has been done because they just don't see what it means. It means quite a deal, quite a good deal, actually. Yes, but I tried to locate these papers under your name. No, not my name. They, probably the key name to look for is Blasco, B-L-A-S-C-O. Uh, Dr. Maria Blasco is the director of an institute called CNIO in Madrid. It's one of the world's preeminent cancer institutes. And she is very focused on telomerase, as I am. We've known, of, known each other for years, and we both like to see this taken to clinical studies. But she is really the lead person on this and deserves the credit for it, not me. But did you perform your own tests on mice? No, I didn't do any of that mouse data. You know, my work has always been in clinical medicine, originally publishing the, the first articles in this 20 years ago, and a textbook on this. But no, I'm not the researcher, that's Maria. I'm the one who wants to take it to clinical work, as does Maria. But Maria is the one who's done, Maria Blasco is the one who's done the animal work, not me. But in this case, how can you be sure that the FDA will approve you to perform tests based on someone else's research? Yes, well, of course, you can never be sure, can you? But Maria is a collaborator on this, and the data really speaks for itself. We anticipate that the FDA will require the usual uh, careful guarantees and data that they would for any other human trial. That is, they want to make sure it's safe, not going to cause more problems than it cures. Um, but the data really speaks for itself. And it's not a question of who did the data. It's a question is of whether the data supports it as, as safe and likely to be effective. Okay, so let's assume Dr. Maria Blasco will get the FDA approval then what would be the benefit for you in order to make the human trials after she obtained the approval? You know, Maria, Maria wouldn't get the approval. The approval would come to, to myself and to our biotech company as we move ahead. But Maria is a collaborator on this. The, the FDA will require animal data not to prove that it works, which Maria has essentially shown, but to, for proof of safety. And so we will run an additional test for the FDA to prove safety. But the, the permission to go ahead with a human study will come to us, not to Maria. Maria doesn't do human work. She does mouse work. I don't do mouse work. I do human work. Oh, yes, yes. Now I have a clear understanding. But other scientists who never met you in person may not have this understanding. Why you had not published articles in journals? No, all of the animal research, the, the, the credit for that goes to Maria Velasco and she deserves it. Next question. What will be the first procedures once the telomerase activator will be ready for the human trial test? Is it an injection? Well, we won't actually be using a telomerase activator. We'll be using a telomerase gene instead. It's a little different. The outcome you might think is the same, but the gene is much more powerful than just an activator. Um, <clears throat> what it will be will be an injection. The initial human trial is planned to be, a, think of it as a lumbar puncture, as though you were getting a, a lumbar puncture or an epidural or subdural for delivering a baby. Um, it will be a, an injection into the back, uh, and it will take, we'll be following people for about six months looking for improvements. 
and we anticipate seeing those improvements in very much in terms of their behavior, as well as measures, uh, imaging measures, for example, MRI scans and PET scans, as well as laboratory studies, for example, on blood and on the cerebral spinal fluid itself. It'll be a one-time injection, by the way. This is not something that we'll be giving patients three times a day orally. It'll be a one-time injection, and that will be it. We'll be done. Should everyone respond the same to telomerase? Um, I anticipate people will respond somewhat differently, but in general, the effects will be universal. Uh, so let me give you an example. Uh, there is a gene called APOE4, which is related to your risk of getting Alzheimer's. No, it's related to the risk. Some people have the gene, don't get Alzheimer's. Some people don't have the gene and do get Alzheimer's. Uh, and likewise, there's a protective gene, theoretically, called APOE2. Same routine. Some people still get Alzheimer's. Most people less likely to get it if they have the good gene. <clears throat> Um, but all of those people, whether they have APOE2 or APOE4, should respond very well to the treatment. I anticipate, however, that people with APOE2 will respond a little better because they essentially have a, a smaller burden uh, for the glial cells that will be affecting the brain. So the outcome is people will all be a little different. We're all a little different. We have our own personalities, our own genes, our own diseases. But in general, there'll be a universal response which will be positive and will improve people's behavior and all the other measures we look at. But the behavior is key, obviously. Most of us care very little about lab tests. We care a great deal about whether we can still function, remember our names, go to work, feed ourselves, and so forth. Is the estimated amount of telomerase activator to reset all cell telomeres in milligrams or less than milligrams? Well, again, we will not be using a telomerase activator. It's a telomerase gene, so it's different in the way it works. But the amount we'll be giving will be in terms of milligrams. It'll be a very small amount. Uh, if I were to look at a syringe, it's probably the amount that I could put in a, a 5cc syringe or less. It will be a small amount. And you believe this quantity will be just enough to reset 80 trillion cells telomeres? Well, um, that's a great question, and, and it sort of depends on where you're giving this and, and the kind of a, um, a vector you use. We anticipate it'll be enough to reset all of the cells we need to reset within the brain, uh, as well as some of the vascular structures in the brain, but whether it'll reset cells in the rest of the body is an issue that we're not as concerned about initially. Initially, we just want to show that we can use this to cure Alzheimer's. Now, ultimately, you're right. Ultimately, we'd like to cure all of the cells in the body. Uh, for example, for vascular diseases and other things throughout the body. But initially, we're aiming at the brain, and this will be an amount that's calculated to be able to reset the tissues of the brain. So the injection will be epidural or subepidural. Where exactly it will be performed? And would that require using also an X-ray machine? Well, generally, it won't need an x-ray machine, although sometimes with older people, it's harder to get the, the lumbar space. What we'll be trying to do is get into the lumbar space. It's, a, it's an area that has fluid in it, but in, in the case we're looking at, uh, the spine doesn't extend down that far. It's in the middle of your lumbar spine. And it's the same thing you would do if, if you went in and saw your doctor and they were concerned that you might have, for example, a meningitis. They might do a lumbar puncture on you or for some other indications. It's the exact same procedure, except we'll take a little fluid out to test and we'll put a little fluid back in, in this case, the gene therapy. So it's, it's that simple. It usually takes five minutes. Uh, it's done with people either lying on their side or sitting up hunched over, and it usually doesn't require an X-ray. Now, we will, however, be doing MRI scans and PET scans, think of those imaging studies of the brain, independent of the LP, of the lumbar function. We'll be doing that as well, because we want to show that we can actually improve function within the brain. Um, and we'll be testing it both in terms of the imaging, the CAT scans and MRI scans, or the uh, PET scans and MRI scans, and in terms of the blood and the lumbar fluid we remove when we do the lumbar puncture. And we'll also be looking at behavior. So imaging, laboratory, behavior, all three of those. But if the enzyme is delivered first in the spinal cord, then from there, how can it knows to circulate in the whole body, enter every cell, then enter the nucleus and activate the gene to produce new telomeres at both ends of the DNA strain. It 
seems to me extremely complex. Well, it's not magic. It's simple clinical science. We have two things going for us. One is that there is active circulation, active flow of the fluid from the lumbar space that we're looking at throughout the rest of the brain. And that's just normal flow. The second, though, is that the, uh, the viral vector we're using, the gene therapy we're using, is targeted at the cells we're looking at. So, for example, it will go after nerve cells. It will go after the cells that line the vessels of the brain. It will go after many of the glial cells because it essentially it has the right address. You know, any virus, whether I get a flu virus or you name any virus at all, it has an address on the virus that says what part of your body to get. So if I get a virus that causes a cold, it's because it likes to get the mucous membranes in my nose. If I have an influenza virus, it may affect many other cells in my body. But every virus has an address. What we're doing is removing the inside of the envelope and putting in a gene we want in there, a human gene, telomerase gene, but keeping the envelope with the address. And the address says, go to the rest of those brain cells. So one, the flow takes us up there naturally. And two, each of the various viruses are aimed at particular cells. About what you had just said, let me show this comparative example. I have an envelope and I write destination, go to glial cells or somatic cells, whatever. And here I write the expeditor from Professor Fossel. And here is the stamp. So my body recognized this is an authentic letter. And inside I have an instruction which said, please print GGGTTA n times and then stop. Yes, that's, it. that's exactly it. So let me explain that analogy a bit. You know, it, on a normal virus, when I pick up a cold virus or an influenza virus, I have an envelope with an address on it, and inside there's a letter, and the letter says, make more influenza or make more cold virus. That's a normal virus that causes problems for us. Now, the virus we're using is very different. It's never been known to cause disease in humans, but it has a very nice envelope and a very nice address, and it has been used already successfully in children to cure genetic diseases. In the last few months, there's been some nice demonstrations of this, wonderful effect. We're using that same envelope and that same sort of address on the outside, but we're removing the, the inside letter and putting in a letter that says, as you said, you know, it, it's a genetic code. In this case, it says make a normal human gene for telomerase to reset the damage that, goes in, that, go, that occurs with Alzheimer's disease. So we're using a, a natural envelope and a natural address and substituting a normal, natural human gene to do what we need to, be, need to have done. I have a small device here because I like to see things from an engineer point of view. Uh, let's assume that I can activate the telomerase enzyme in two ways. First, I would like to say make one copy, one single copy of this molecule. So I have a button and I press here and the LED is lighting only once. Can you see the LED lighting? Yes, I see the red light go on. So if I press this button once, I can make one copy. And when I release the button, now it come back and interrupt the current. So the LED is no more active. Now, I would like to say, make 1,500 copies per second, every second, because I'm multiplying 1,500 cells every second, and those cells need fresh full telomeres. Well, I, I can't press this button 1,005 times per second. I can't do it. But I have another one, a larger button here, which is a switch on and off. And you see, this would need more energy to make a switch. And once it makes this switch, does not return back. 
And I wish to illustrate that uh, this larger button has the equivalent of changing the gene expression who activates the telomerase enzyme to produce 1,500 copies per second. So the difference is by activating rarely the telomerase enzyme in somatic cells, I may use the alternately switch, which is smaller and easier to operate. Well, I'm not sure what the question is, but let me take your analogy and run with it. Um, what we do is not only do we have the envelope with the address that goes in, but inside the envelope, there are two parts. One is the active telomerase gene, the gene that creates the active enzyme that makes telomerase work. And the other is called a promoter. And the promoter gene does much like perhaps your big button does, which is it says, make lots of these. Don't just make one telomerase molecule and extend the telomeres a little bit, but make a lot of it. Make a lot of it all at once and continue to do that for a while. Now, after a while, as it turns out, uh, as the cells divide and as time goes by, the, the envelope that we put in there will wear away. So we will re-extend telomeres, but after a while, the effect will fade, which is fine. We don't need it to be in there for a long time. We need it to be in there just long enough to re-extend telomeres, reset gene expression, and essentially make the cell function normally again. Yes, so, because yes, we have that's, to be that's very... part of what the promoter molecule does, Christian, is it makes sure that it's, we make enough telomerase to do what we need to do. Yes, yes, but uh, this, uh, this is why I made the model, in order to explain that we should be careful not to make too much telomerase, otherwise the cells multiply without control. Yeah, that, that's actually not quite what happens. You know, you bring up the answer, essentially you bring up the question of cancer, and it turns out not to be that simple. <clears throat> Many people have thought that if you had too much telomerase, you'd create uncontrolled cell growth and you'd get cancer. <clears throat> well, no, actually. It turns out you actually lower the risk of cancer in most cases. But it's complicated. It turns out that if the telomere is, <clears throat> is completely short, the cell won't divide, whether it's got cancer or not, and you're fine. If the cell has very long telomeres, <clears throat> it will divide, but it also repairs DNA well. But in between, there's this little zone where if the telomere is a little short, but not too short, the cell can still divide, but it's not repairing DNA well enough, and so your risk of cancer goes up. So it's complicated. <clears throat> but the quick answer, the, the essentially the, the facile answer, the, maybe it's the naive answer in some ways, is that telomerase not only doesn't prevent cancer, I mean, doesn't cause cancer, but probably will actually prevent it, and in some cases may be used to treat it. So it is complicated. It is not easy. But it, certainly, it is not true that telomerase causes cancer. It simply doesn't. Please review for a better understanding if these two situations are correct. Situation number one, activating telomerase enzyme from the inside of the nucleus every time. That means transcription factors inside nucleus make activating the telomerase gene, which activate telomerase enzyme continuously, and then adding telomeres to all newly created cells. This is the metaphoric equivalent of a Xerox machine with a button pressed continuously, so the machine is making copies one after another. Situation two, activating telomerase enzyme from outside of the cell only once time. This is the metaphoric equivalent of a Xerox machine with a button pressed shortly only once, so the machine is making one single copy and then goes into standby. I'm not sure I understand this. <clears throat> I'm going to read it out loud because I'm not sure. Situation one, activating telomerase enzyme from the inside of the nucleus. Right? When I press, press the button continuously on a Xerox machine. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, what we do is we, we put the trans... I guess we can call it a transcription factor. Um, <clears throat> we put the human telomerase gene and the promoter into the cell, it creates telomerase um, and it re-extends the telomeres. But that as the cell divides, we lose that, that inserted gene that we've put in. And so things settle down again. Um, so it certainly doesn't continue to, to go on and on and on. After a while, it, it has a natural limit to it. And um, situation two? I'm not sure what you mean by activating telomerase enzyme from outside of the cell. 
uh, by sending the letter, sending the letter. So when you send the letter, this is from outside. Well, what we're doing is we're sending a letter from the outside, but we're putting in a gene and a promoter that create a lot of telomerase for a limited time. So I'm not sure, I'm a little still confused about the, the, the metaphor of the Xerox machine. It's um, neither one's quite right. We don't just make a single copy, but it doesn't go continually. It, it's self-limited. Okay, so in both situations, the process is limited in time and they do not continue indefinitely. That's correct. We create a burst of telomerase, we reset telomeres, and then there is a, a natural self-limiting process involved here. We also know that using this same envelope and, and address, uh, it is self-limited in human beings and does not cause a problem in children, for example. That's already been through the FDA and is in successful use. But what if the body of a certain patient rejects the activator or simply ignore it? Would that be possible? Uh, again, Christian, I want to stress, we are not using a telomerase activator. This is not a telomerase activator. It is not an activator in any way. It is the gene itself. Rather than activate the gene, we're putting in the gene, not an activator. Okay, I'll change the term for the next questions. Uh, uh, because I had borrowed the terminology of telomerase activator from our earlier interviews broadcasting two years ago. Understood. Um, the, the body, there are several points at which you might find it wouldn't work. I mean, one would be, will it get into the cell? Um, and there, it not only depends on the address in the envelope, but there are also immune effects. For example, if the body has seen the virus before, Will it essentially kill the virus, that is, burn the envelope, destroy the envelope before it can get to the address? Um, and so far, that has not been a problem. I could get into the, the details of it, uh, and we pre-treat the patient with a short burst of steroids to lower that risk anyway, and it works very well with the children. Um, so, so far, that's not been a problem, although it's something that we think about. Um, the other issue is once you get into the cell, uh, will, will the body reject it or ignore it? And the answer is no. Uh, once we get it in there, that's why we have the normal human gene and the promoter to say, please express this, you know, copy the envelope or copy the, the letter. Um, so, no, that's really not been a problem. Uh, not only theoretically is it not a problem, but when it's actually done in human patients, it's not a problem in other studies. So, no, a reasonable question, but it has not proved to be a practical issue. About your new approach and explanation, can you help me how to add a note for the new viewers watching our present and previous interviews when we are talking about telomerase activator? Please help us to interpret your new approach. Right. Well, there are a number of approaches that can be used to re-extend telomeres. And one of those approaches is to use an activator. And another approach would be to use a gene. The difference is this, an activator is a small molecule that goes in and turns on the gene that you already have, okay? Now, the problem is we find it doesn't turn it on very well. That's a limit to it. Plus, it can have some other effects. That's a concern, too. <clears throat> so what we've opted to do is to take a more direct approach. And rather than trying to activate the gene that you have that's locked up and we can't get it to work very well, we simply take another normal human gene of the same gene, put it in there, and let it be expressed. So we're bypassing the need for an activator, simply putting in the gene. And what you find is that works very well. We can get a much more powerful effect and we can get what we want done with no side effects, which is, as I say, part of the issue with activators. So activators tend to be not as powerful as we'd like, and they have a tendency to have some side effects as well, or potential side effects. Whereas the gene therapy, we're using a perfectly normal human gene, getting much more powerful effects with fewer side effects. Okay, so this is now the new approach for solving these problems which we had been discussing in our previous four parts reverse aging interviews. Yes, it's an approach that, you know, has, that I've been aware of for, for 20 years and talked about, I know, in my textbook, but now we're able to do it technically, which is important. Let me give you a, a different analogy here about the activator versus the, uh, the putting in the gene. Um, Let's say that you have a room that is dark and someplace in that room, you know, there's a switch and you could turn the switch on or off. The switch would be the activator. The problem is you don't know where the switch is 
you fumble around the room and you keep hitting the wrong switches. And when you turn it on, the switch doesn't seem to work as well as you'd want to. So that's the activator problem. It's an elegant solution if you can get it to work. But as I say, you tend to hit some of the wrong switches. And when you turn on the switch, you're not getting quite the right switch and getting good effect. The other option is simply bring a, a light into the room, bring a, a flashlight, a torch into the room and light it up. And that's what we're doing. We're, take, we're saying, you know, <clears throat> we can't quite figure out how the switches work effectively and we keep hitting the wrong switches. So let's just bring our own light in. We, plug, we bring in a light, we plug it in, we turn it on and we're all set. Yes, thank you very much for clarifying this. And now we all have a much better understanding. Next question is about a movie I watched earlier this year and is called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lex appeared in the year 2017. A very impressive story. Please tell us why those cells are so special compared to other cancer cells of billions of cancer patients. You're asking about uh, about the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks yeah. as an example of this. Um, there are, let me say that, that if I look at cells generally throughout the whole planet, many of the cells that we're used to, cells of our body, are self-limited. They divide a certain number of times, they become more and more aged, senescent, less and less functional, and we get disease. But there are also cells that are immortal. And the, the example of this would be the cells that created your body in the first place. You've got a cell from your mother and you got part of the DNA from your father. But if I look at the cell you got from your mother, she got it from her mother, who got it from her mother, and that line of cells can be tracked back for three and a half billion years on this planet. So it has essentially been immortal. It's been an immortal cell that never died. And you end up with, with that cell uh, becoming a fertilized zygote and creating your human body. Now, within your body, some of your, most of your cells age. Some of your cells, some of the stem cells age very slowly. And some of the cells, for example, the sperm or ova, don't really age at all. They maintain themselves perfectly normal with normal gene function so they can go on and create another human being, your offspring. <clears throat> now, there is another kind of cell that tends to be uh, immortal, and we wish it wouldn't be, and that would be cancer cells. Cancer cells continue to divide when they are already damaged and they're not at all normal. Now, your normal ova and sperm are immortal, but they're also normal, whereas the cancer cells are immortal, but very abnormal. So, you know, immortality doesn't mean it's normal or not, not normal. It depends whether you're looking at normal ova and sperm or whether you're looking at cancer cells. So those cells, cells are always special, whether you're looking at cancer cells or the germ cells, the ova and sperm. They're always special because they don't show effects of aging. They continue to maintain... Uh, the ability to divide. Um, what we're doing is taking your normal body cells and resetting the clock so that they act like they did when you were, for example, 20 years old. They act like normal adult cells rather than cells that are, say, 70 years old. Uh, but we are not turning them back into cancer cells in any sense. We're making them act like normal young cells, more like stem cells, or in this case, embryonic stem cells. They, they're acting more like normal young cells. And certainly not acting like cancer cells. So the, the Henrietta Lacks cells are very interesting because they don't show evidence of, of aging, although they are clearly damaged. Very different, very different from the cells that we're dealing with in our bodies that we're concerned about for Alzheimer's, for example. And how many kilograms of Henrietta cells have been produced until today? I, I don't know. I've seen wild estimates. And I remember the, the estimates back in the 50s and 60s uh, for the same sort of thing it was an estimate about chicken heart cells. And it wasn't true, but they estimated that they could grow as many cells as the, as the sun by now, um, that kind of weight. Uh, the reality is that a lot of these cells have divided and either died or been killed. Uh, that is, they you know, were not continued, maintained in the lab. They were allowed to die. Uh, but it is true that if, we, if all of those cells had been maintained and continued to be supported, the mass would be spectacular. Still, there's not enough food, oxygen, and, and, and interested laboratory people to maintain all of these cells. You simply can't do it. There aren't enough resources. So we know cancer cells don't age, but what about stem cells and reproductive cells? How does stem cells age? The, let's take um, a sort of a spectrum. On the one hand, we have normal somatic cells that age. On the other hand, we have 
the reproductive cells, sperm and ova cells that don't age. That is, again, as I said, the cell you got from your mother had been around for three and a half billion years. It did fine all that time. You had cells that were damaged or that died, but the ones you got were pretty good. Again, you may have inherited some genetic defects or something because there may have been a mutation, but in general, all the cells we got are normal human cells, been around for billions of years retroactively, didn't age, whereas most of your body cells do age. In between, however, are stem cells. And some of the stem cells we have are very much similar to immortal cells. That is, they age very, very slowly, and others age relatively quickly, whereas most of our body cells age a great deal. So as an example, um, as I said, your sperm and ova cells essentially don't age, whereas many of your, for example, skin cells do age. But if I look at some of the cells in your bone marrow, the hematopoietic stem cells, that continue at age 100 to create your blood cells, your red cells, your white cells, those cells age, but very slowly. So again, they're sort of intermediate on the spectrum. Otherwise, we would all become anemic at age 50. They've got just enough telomerase to continue to reset gene expression so that you can continue to make blood cells at age 105. Well, this is very amazing, including for my own research. And I wish to ask you that if the reproductive cells stay young all the time, then inside the cells, all the organelles also stay young? Yes, they do. <clears throat> That's exactly right. What you find is that, again, the reproductive cells, and again, the sperm and the ovum, um, have just enough telomerase to continue to reset that clock, reset the telomere. And so they maintain a normal cellular function indefinitely. Because in this case, if those organelles do not age, then they can replace others from other cells who are aging using these new ones, which are not aging. Well, again, you know, the emphasis on mitochondria is misplaced, and it shows a basic misunderstanding of the biology when people raise this issue for aging. Because the same thing can be said of the mitochondria that I've said regarding the germ cells, the sperm and ova. The, you know, you got all of your mitochondria from your mother, who got all of her mitochondria from her mother, and those have been in eukaryotic cells on this planet for in excess of a billion and a half years. So in a very real way, every single mitochondria in your body was inherited from your mother and was 1.5 billion years old and had no evidence of aging. And yet we see evidence of aging in those somatic cells over your decades that you and I have been alive. What you find though, is that what determines mitochondrial aging is not the mitochondria per se, but it's the tel telomere changes that occur in the nucleus. Most of the enzymes in the mitochondria are coded for back in the nucleus, all the important aerobic enzymes. And what you find is the turnover rate of these goes down as the telomere shortens. So your mitochondria becomes more and more dysfunctional as time goes by. That does not happen in the germ cells, the ova and sperm cells. They continue to have good telomere function, so they continue to have good mitochondrial function, despite the fact that they're a billion and a half years old. So it is not the chronological age that's important for mitochondria, it's the telomere age that's important. And that can be reset quite nicely, thank you. But can you tell me if the mitochondrial DNA needs any reset? No, that's interesting because the mitochondria have a number of key genes that are, they have to be close inside the mitochondria because you need rapid feedback. I won't get into it technically, but the genes that are coded for the mitochondria are coded on a ring chromosome. So there is no telomere, so they never shorten, so they never age. However, it turns out the genes that are most important for aerobic metabolism are coded for in the nucleus, so they change as the telomere shortens, so you get a less functional mitochondria. The same is true of the membranes of the mitochondria that leak reactive oxygen species. So the reason that we see increased free radicals in older cells is not because of the mitochondria per se, it's because the lipid molecules in the mitochondrial membranes are no longer turned over as fast, they're not repaired as quickly. And again, that's because of the telomere, and that again can be reset nicely. So every time we look at mitochondrial dysfunction, as we look at mitochondrial dysfunction over time, for example, cell senescence, failing, failing mitochondria, free radical damage, all of this can be traced back to telomere changes, and all of that can be reset. Whereas everything we look at that is innate in the mitochondria, the ring chromosomes, don't show any aging. The mitochondria per se don't age. All the mitochondrial aging it can be ascribed to changes back in the telomere and the nucleus. Again, that can be reset. 
And that makes sense, again, when you think about what's going on with the mitochondrial inheritance, because as I say, mitochondria have been around a billion and a half years. Mitochondria are immortal. Cells are immortal. But certain mitochondria and certain cells show aging, and those are the same ones that show telomere shortening. Mitochondria per se don't age. It's all secondary to changes in, in the telomere. But this is amazing because I had just performed a third MRI in April this year and it shows even more improvement instead of degeneration speed to take over regeneration. And this is exactly the opposite. How can we interpret this from a telomere activity point of view? Well, there are two possibilities. The one is that it isn't true. It may just be that it's a, a, an artifact of the scan or the interpreter. That's possible. Uh, that is, it may not be just not true. But let's assume it is true. Let's assume that there's improvement. That would suggest that something is going on in your brain that is improving cell function. Now, that could be because the telomeres have been lengthened because perhaps you're using a telomerase activator. It could be. Or it could be that whatever stresses you were undergoing before have resolved, and now your glial cells and your neurons are able to function better because they're no longer stressed. For example, could be before you had a viral infection or malnutrition, the bad diet, or any number of other things. Once those have been resolved, the cells are able to function a little closer to normal, and so you see a better MRI result. In short, I can't tell. I don't know. I, one, I don't know that's really true, and two, I don't know what caused it if it did happen. Yeah, I already had been thinking about this possibility, and I sent my MRI complete archives for a double-blind interpretation test, and... I will let you know the conclusions. Uh, it may be true, Christian. Let me give you another example of this. How many times have you seen somebody, a friend of yours perhaps, who looked terrible? They just looked very unhealthy. And it turns out they just had uh, a disease, cancer, for example, uh, or a bad viral infection, or they'd undergone a divorce, or they lost their job, or whatever. And now they have a, a new job, they're happy with their lives, they have a better diet, they're exercising regularly, and they look much, much better. If I do any number of physical measures in those patients, you probably find the same thing. Any numbers of stress, of their ability to respond to viral infections in the future, they probably show some improvement. And it's not because their telomeres have lengthened, it's because they've removed a lot of the stress and the damage that was going on previously. They're now over the problem. So that can be part of it. Or again, if you're taking telomerase activators, that could be part of the, the solution as well. I don't know. We have here in Romania something called astragalus and TA65. Or astragenol is the, is the more active compound within yeah. the astragalus. But it's very expensive I, and I did not buy. And in the past four years, I did have some stress and worries regarding other problems but it seemed that they had been counteracted and the degeneration speed did not take over y yet. Let's talk about the neuron cells. If they don't divide, that means they are aging and eventually die. Is that true? I, I thought you said if they don't divide, they age. Say that again. So if they don't divide, that means they are aging. No, if cells don't divide, then cellular aging is not occurring, but that doesn't mean they're not, there isn't damage. So, for example, most of my heart cells don't divide. Actually, they do very slowly, heart muscle. But, but classically, we would say the cells don't divide. But the problem isn't the division of the heart cells. The problem is the arterial supply of those heart cells, which shows rapid division. So even if it were true that heart muscle cells never divide, if that were absolutely true, you still end up with damage, but it's not because of the heart muscle, it's because of the arterial supply. Uh, now, you know, if I'm talking about cell aging, I could argue then that, that cells in your muscle of your heart don't age, but cells in your arteries do. Either way, it doesn't matter. If you get a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, it still is a death, but it wasn't the heart cell that caused it, it was the artery that caused it. The same thing is really true with Alzheimer's disease. You know, classically, we say that neurons in the adult brain never divide. Well, <clears throat> there are some exceptions to that. But in generally, let's say they don't, but the glial cells divide. <clears throat> so if I get Alzheimer's, it's not because of cell senescence or cell aging in the neuron. It's because of cell aging or cell senescence in the glial cells. Either way, the result is Alzheimer's. But it's not the neuron's fault. It's the glial cell's fault. And who is helping the neurons to stay alive? In this case, the glial cells. 
it, back to that analogy about the heart. You know, the heart cells aren't a problem. It's the artery cells that are the problem. The arteries keep your muscle and your heart alive. The glial cells, in a way, keep the neurons alive in your brain. The neurons are sort of minding their own business. They are the innocent bystanders. But they are heavily dependent upon the glial cells. And if the glial cells don't work, and they don't, you find you begin to have neural cell loss. The neurons die through no fault of their own. They're just no longer taken care of very well with the glial cells. So the letter for resetting the telomeres is mainly for the glial cells? Yes, and it turns out there are multiple kinds of glial cells, and the, the letter will address certain of them and not others. It will also address the vascular cells of the brain. So we know that a lot of, of dementia in the elderly is caused by vascular changes, which we can address. Even in Alzheimer's, there's a certain amount of overlap here. So we can address the neurons directly, we can address many of the glial cells, we can address the vascular cells, and what we do know is it's very effective in animals. How can you make the pace of the repairs at the optimum level, which means not very quick, but also not very slow? Why would you want it to be not very quick? I would think I would want the pace of the, the improvement, the regeneration, the rejuvenation to be very quick. Well... I don't know. Well, in, in any case, you know, the, the best we can do is try to optimize the pattern of repair, regeneration, recycling within these cells. And to do that, what we need to do is optimally deliver telomerase for at least a short burst, for example, a few weeks, months, and that we can do very well. The, technically, what we need to watch out for is empty envelopes. We can't very well have, afford to send in an envelope with no letter in it. We need to make sure that the address of the envelopes is correct. Uh, it goes to the correct cells. And we have to make sure that the immune system doesn't destroy the envelope before it gets there. So those are the sort of technical problems we deal with at a clinical level as we're trying to go ahead to human trials. But once it gets in there, it's effective. And it, there's not a problem with too much telomerase. It's simply, uh, you know, that there's a natural limitation to how far we can extend telomeres. And it's easy to optimize, once we get it in there, it's easy to optimize that regeneration or repair or recycling rate for at least a short time. A short time being measured in years. Let me change the tape. Data viitoare vom continua dialogul cu profesorul Fossel cu privire la reactivarea genetică a telomerazei, terapia Alzheimer, reversul îmbătrânirii și multe altele. Fiți alături de noi data viitoare la o nouă întâlnire cu știință și cunoaștere.